Wa ala Muhammad wa ajjal farajahum. Thank you very much, Brother Muhammad Raza, for this beautiful recitation. Jazakallah khaira, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Uh, uh, Assalamu alaikum again. Taqabbal ala minkum. Thank you all for joining us for tonight. As you know, uh, this is the kickoff and the beginning of the uh, APSA quarantinement series that will be held uh, during the next following days, inshallah. And uh, tonight uh, we are um, honored to be the host uh, of this program uh, from APSA at Virginia Tech. As you uh, probably know, APSA at Virginia Tech has been founded uh, for about, um, I think they started in 2015 uh, by a couple of brothers and sisters. And Alhamdulillah, it has been constantly uh, working throughout uh, the journey of uh, spreading the word of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam and raising awareness and familiarizing people on campus about Islam, especially the Ahlul Bayt, the Sira, and the Sunnah that we have had uh, um, in our uh, religion. And also um, during the last few years, we have been able to, ha uh, to hold a couple of different events. As you probably know, the Arabian Photography Exhibition, Nurse Days, Hussein Days, Alhamdulillah, so many different programs. Uh, we had to shift a little bit the gear and uh, during the last year because of pandemic, uh, we have been holding the programs mostly online, including weekly du'as, uh, Nahjul Balagha sessions, weekly again, for on sessions. And inshallah, after the pandemic, we can get back to the normal life, all of us, including the absurd Virginia Tech. And uh, so the presenter tonight, Sister uh, Mansoura Sadat Jalali, is one of the uh, active members um, in our APSA, in our organization. Uh, 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 Sister Mansoura Sadat is a PhD student in architecture at, here at Virginia Tech. Uh, her main research area includes human-centric design and occupants well-being in the interior uh, spaces. Uh, she has had opportunity to visit many Iranian architectural masterpieces during her undergrad. That uh, tonight's pr uh, presentation that is very interesting is the result of some, uh, those uh, sightseeing. Uh, so Sister Mansura has so many different talents, and inshallah you will hear more about the others in future years, but tonight we'll have uh, the presentation about the calligraphy in uh, Islamic Iranian architecture. With that, let's invite since Sister Mansura uh, by reciting Allah salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ajjal farajahum. So hello, thank you very much for the introduction. That, that was too much actually for me, but thank you. Uh, so I start by sharing my screen um, here. So can you see the full screen view right now? Yes. Okay. So as the title says, this one, this presentation is about calligraphy in Islamic Persian architecture. So the reason it's it's Persian because it, it's because of my own experience living in Iran. And why it's not moving? Okay. So calligraphy in architecture happens when um, two different forms of art. Um, come together and create a space. So architecture and calligraphy seem very separate, but when they are present together in buildings, we can actually see how they would affect uh, our perception and like the, how they affect the space in the building. And this is actually what makes our architecture different from uh, Western uh, religious buildings. For example, as you can see here in those examples, uh, the churches usually don't have any sort of calligraphy in, in the interior or exterior of their buildings, but in Islamic architecture, you find plenty of different types of calligraphies in, inside the building, but both inside and outside the building. And in churches, there are usually some small pieces of writings about the name of the know, architect or things like that, but basically the message is carried through paintings but in except for uh, but in like islamic architecture we don't see any of those paintings inside the buildings so the question here is why our islamic ancestors 
his Muslim ancestors, I would say, uh, chose to use calligraphy as a form of art to convey those messages. Uh, there are probably many, many reasons for that, but some people believe that it is rooted actually in Islam itself because our uh, prophet's uh, miracle was actually a book. So it shows the importance of the book and writing in Islam. And also there are uh, like writing is appreciated in many different uh, surahs of Quran. For example, here in Surah al it says, uh, it's about God that is teaching us with uh, through writing. And also Noon Yasurun in Surah Qalam. Uh, so it shows the importance of writing in Islam. And Sayyid Hussein and Nasr believes that calligraphy is a complementary sacred art, art of Islam, which makes, it's kind of manifesting the words of God uh, that are revealed in Quran. And is, uh, it is believed that uh, it is originated by uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib. I would, I would talk about it in a minute. Next the slides, I'm moving. Okay, so the second reason might be uh, the, because it is very suggested or it is mustahab or has a sahbab to write Quran in a nice way and use calligraphy for writing that. And the person who was writing the Quran, uh, is writing Quran calligraphy is good to have wudu, be clean and like uh, tayyib before starting to write. And we'll count it's, uh, this work as a part of self-edification or tahdib uh, nafs, we say. Uh, so uh, it is a recommend that the person that's writing Quran to be both inside and outside clean before starting to do that. And it is believed, as I said, the person who started to write Quran in calligraphy was Imam Ali. And this is a, a handwriting which some people believe that is written by Imam Ali. And as you can see here, you clearly see the calligraphy. You see, clearly see that he was trying to write Quran in a nice way, and uh, and another verse, for, another uh, hadith from Imam Ali that says the beauty of writing is the tongue of the hand and the elegance of the thought. So again, it is emphasizing that it is important to write Quran in a nice way. And also, as we all know, worshiping uh, pictures or like drawing pictures is kind of forbidden. Uh, in Islam, instead uh, they use calligraphy to uh, write Quran and Hadith on the walls of the mosque. So uh, the main reason to use calligraphy instead of just writing them was uh, because even people who couldn't read or write uh, Quran uh, could be able to enjoy the beauty of that art and uh, feel the spirituality in that space. And um, as a prophet says, we know that look, even looking at Quran verses is like about that is like as like praying God. Uh, one of the interesting examples I think can be the Hagia, Hagia Sophia Mosque in Istanbul. As you can see, it, it used to be a church. And after like the Ottoman war war warriors uh, conquered uh, Istanbul, uh, they kind of painted over or covered all those paintings. And, uh, and after years, people started to discover those really beautiful fine mosaic works on just under those uh, plasters, layers of plaster. So it's interesting that they, after they um, won the war, they, instead of demolishing that mosque, they, that church, they just added those minars, the minars are added after Islam, and they covered all those paintings and used calligraphy instead. And after that, we see that calligraphy became present everywhere. Uh, excuse me, some, someone muted me. <laughs> um, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear. I think that was a mistake. Sorry for okay. that. Uh, so, uh, then we started to see that calligraphy became present kind of everywhere in carpets uh, and the bowls and plates in e everywhere, even on the food. Mm, it's frozen. Okay. 
And what are the contents of those scripts? So usually uh, the most common ones are God's name, Quran verses, Tasbih and Takbir of God and Prophets and Imams uh, names or Hadith. And the, li the least common ones are poems, dates, governmental commands and artists and architects signature. So this one here, this picture is actually one of my favorite artist signatures in uh, Persian architecture. This is the signature of the Sheikh Lothwallah Mosque's uh, architect. And it is just a very small like inscription and it's really hard to find it if you don't know where it is, but it's in the mihrab of the masjid. And as you can see, he, uh, I don't know if you can read uh, Farsi, but it says, this is made by a person, uh, like he, he was kind of very humble. Amalun faqirun haqirun muhtaj be rahmat khoda Muhammad Reza ibn Ustad Hussein Banu Isfahani. So he doesn't even call himself master or Ustad, he calls his father uh, master. So he just tells his own first name and then calls his father as the master. So it was pretty humble and nice. So how would those uh, writings uh, affect our space? So I feel like they deeply affect the space. Just try imagining this frame here without these inscriptions, without those calligraphies and handwritings around the dome and around those these arches. So uh, I think these calligraphies are, aren't just uh, you know aren't just a piece of art. They're actually the architect is using them very like in a smart way to be able to separate and frame different parts of, of his design and uh, kind of emphasize the importance of different parts. So the first um, purpose was the effect that those inscriptions on those holy words have on the visitors. So just simply looking at those inscriptions, you see that it's not easy to read them. And I usually don't try to read them. I can't remember if I ever tried to read those because it's really hard. So probably they had a more important purpose and they were supposed to like, you know, penetrate your soul and affect your, affect your mood and feelings probably in the space. And they're most of the time really hard to read. And so the main purpose of the artist wasn't just uh, to write something that people could read. It was to inspire people. So the... I don't know, the famous example of the vessel and the con container and the contents. So if we consider calligraphy as a, as a vessel and the meaning of it as, a, as its content, so we see that they are hardly interwoven, that it's really hard to separate them. And so as we know, these are holy words from Quran, from Hadith. Most of the time, they even were feeding a whole surah in an inscription. So the main goal, one of the main goals could be creating a sacred environment because the, those architects, those master calligraphers and uh, architects knew actually how, how those words are going to affect people. And uh, so they were actually kind of trying to create a space that would help people that are trying to seek taqarrub al Allah or they're trying to be closer to God. Just like the feeling that comes from uh, directing our buildings toward the direction of Qibla. Uh, so those words are going to affect us too. And also, uh, Calligraphy, as I said, was a respected form of art and it was beyond its uh, like apparent meaning. And just like abjad numbers, that they're just number, they're, they aren't just numbers, they actually have more meanings. Uh, uh, writings were also used to convey a deeper meaning beyond what you can see. So what was the goal and the main purpose of that person that was doing that art? So uh, one of the main goals was probably to give dignity and like respect to those holy words and letters, because when you when you try to do something nice, you are actually respecting that thing. And uh, they were also uh, with, with this form of art, they were able to convey the hidden joy of those writings to people that would see them. And actually, they, they, uh, those people usually uh, try to first uh, keep themselves away from um, sins and like evil thoughts and do the self-edification or tahdib and nafs to be able to reflect those 
in their in their art. And this is actually the base for every kind of Islamic art. Architecture was the same, and like the art, the, pe the people designing the buildings weren't just like builders, uh, but they were kind of Islamic, just like Islamic scholars. They they had their own way of uh, teaching, like learning architecture, and it wasn't always very easy. So just to explain, like a little more more de detail about that. Um, Actually, most uh, the, most of those artists were uh, like um, Sufis uh, or Sufi uh, like Sufism in uh, Islamic art is a very important thing because they uh, they had a they had their own way to learn and like you know design those buildings and uh, the students of calligraphy just like architecture students or apprentices. Started uh, started to learn with a certified like calligrapher or architect master, who was uh, ultimately had the right to certificate those person or give them the ijaza to to the apprentice to be able to be recognized as a master calligrapher itself. And the master taught the students not only the, um, the outward skills, such as, I don't know, how to uh, position, uh, how to find the correct position for their writings, how to prepare the ink, or how to trim the pen, but also was teaching them how to be modest and to how to obey God and uh, have to maintain like a um, self, I don't know, purity, to have a state of ritual purity. Uh, as it is required for reciting Quran. And I will just tell you why I chose this picture here. So this picture is actually uh, from a book uh, uh, by uh, Mante Rotteir or The Language of Birds, which was, uh, which was written by a Persian uh, poet, Atar Neshaburi. So uh, rather than just focus, focusing on the religious laws, like philosophy, I don't know, theology, things like that, um, and Sufis understand, try to understand and experience God by turning inward and experiencing um, the divine inside themselves. And this is a famous uh, sentence that I just wrote here to break the ink pots and tear the books. So it, so try to learn something that just, that is not just written in the books. Rather, you will learn them when you turn inward and pay attention to yourself. And so this is metaphorically considered by many like those mystics to be the first step actually to become a Sufi. And uh, they believe that this practice was originally under, uh, undertaken by Prophet Muhammad as he was like moving to Hara uh, cave to be able to um, be away from those distractions in the city and to meditate and like talk to God. But we all know that we shouldn't like, you know, be, exaggerate that and be away from family and everything. But like trying to be alone when you are praying God and to have more, more attention to yourself and have more attention inward is considered very important in Islam. And this book, Manta Water, is actually written about. Uh, uh, there were actually the stories about a couple, uh, like, I don't know how many birds are here, but uh, some birds started to follow, uh, what's this, hot hot or hopu, as you can see, it's a bird sitting here. So uh, this uh, hopu is actually uh, the follower of Seymour is apprentice of Seymour, uh, which is uh, is like a mystical bird in Persian literature that represents the the ultimate like a spiritual unity. And uh, these birds are trying to start their pilgrimage under the leadership of, leadership of Hupu or Hot Hot to be able to get them um, to those individual souls and to see more. And uh, of course, th this version of book is, this picture is from the Metropolitan Museum of, Museum of Art in New York. So if you get a chance to go there, you probably want to see this book. But uh, this is not written by at the time of Attar because as you can see, this guy here is holding a weapon and weapons I, I think entered Iran in the 16th century. So that's a, that's a like, that, that was written after Attar, but it's, it's interesting. Okay, so get to architecture. Uh, what are the most common uh, types of uh, calligraphy in Islamic 
Persian architecture. As we know, there are many different types of calligraphies because, because of the emphasis of Islam, many people started and, and also Islam was going to many different regions of the world and all, all those regions based on their own cultures and like forms of art created different types of uh, fonts and calligraphies. But these three are the most common ones in Iranian architecture and the main difference between these three are probably uh, in, the in the curves of those slides and the area of those slides on the paper. And from Kufi to Nastali, uh, we have more curves and less area. So the first one is Kufi. Some people believe that it uh, roots, uh, the roots of this slide goes back to the cuneiforms. And they made there were many changes made on, on this uh, style. And for example, in Mecca and in Medina, there were many changes made, made on them. But the final form was established in the city of Kufa in Iraq. And that's why they call it Kufi. And uh, it was very important form of, form of calligraphy, actually, a style of calligraphy, because it was uh, used for so many years uh, to write Quran. And it's interesting that it can contain too many words in a small frame. And as you can see here, it again confirms the fact that it wasn't just for reading and that you, it's impossible, almost impossible for you to be able to read those, you know, uh, those writings here. But uh, I just, this is in the Jama Mosque of Asfaha, I just wrote this one as an example to see like how many words are fitted in that small frame and the fact that it's not written there, it wasn't there just for reading. And uh, as I said, it was very important writing Quran. For example, this was a, a, a page of Quran from Surah Al-Hijr that was in, written in the eighth uh, century in the Kufi uh, font. And there were so many styles of Kufi handwriting developed later. For example, this one is in Jama Mosque of Isfahan again. This, I think this one's very pretty. This is carved into plaster. And I really, you, you should see this, see this probably inshallah someday, but this is called Moshajar Kufi because of those floral patterns uh, that are mixed with, with the uh, style itself. And for example, this one's called uh, Banai Kufi. And as you can see, uh, there are some geometric shapes uh, and probably these are mainly Muhammad and Ali, probably all of these are Muhammad and Allah probably here. And again, uh, Banai Kufi uh, is very interesting because uh, because Kufi uh, because uh, Kufi handwriting is is a style that it can be used in many different places. Most of the time you see on the body of the minars, you see that the Kufi style handwriting, for example, all of these are Ali, as you can see. And around the dome, as you can see here, in the mehrabs, and they use also many different materials. They use lithographs, tiles, plasters, bricks, and everything uh, to write them. And um, among many different Kufi handwritings, this one was interesting. Uh, so this one is called Suda Kufi. And in the Middle Age and the Renaissance in Europe, it became very common. And uh, especially when they were uh, kind of drawing people from the Holy Land. And the exact reason is kind of unclear that why people, why those artists started to use like pseudo Kufi. But some people say that maybe they mistakenly associated the Middle Eastern scripts with the system of writing that existed in the time of Jesus. And they just uh, found it um, really like, I don't know, they just like to represent people of those times, like the saints or Virgin Mary uh, with those with that font. For example, as you can see here uh, around Virgin Mary, this is called pseudo Kufi that is uh, used or on these dresses, as you can see here. Okay, so the next one is Tholos or Thols. Uh, so actually, Tholos was um, created by an, I don't know, Iranian guy. His name was Ibn Mughla Shirazi. But because he was working for Abbasi, I don't know, dynasty or Abbasi kings, uh, they considered it as an Arabic, like as an Arabic root, uh, root a font with Arabic roots. But it was uh, developed in the early 14th century, but appeared in architecture around 6th to 7th, 8th century. 
I think compared to Kufi, it looks finer. There are more curves and uh, the letters are more interwoven. And, and the area is less than Kufi, as you can see. The, the reason they named it Thulus is kind of vague, but Thulus in Arabic means a third. Uh, um, some people say that maybe one third of each uh, letter slopes, or maybe it's because the smallest width of the letter is one third of the widest part. So it's unclear, but it's kind of related to the one third thing, but we're not sure why they named it that way. As you can see here, uh, Jared with Kufi and Thodos uh, uh, phones together here. And these are two, I think, nice examples in the Shah Mosque of Isfahan and Jama Mosque. Okay, and uh, so it was first developed by an Iranian guy, but uh, Mehmet Shepki Efendi, he was like a, a calligrapher in the Ottoman dynasty, probably in the 14th uh, century, kind of gave it the, the shape that we see today, today in writing Quran. Uh, so he probably owns that phone, but we, we sure know that he wasn't Persian, he was Turk. And as you can see, uh, this font, just like any other fonts, contains uh, horizontal letters and vertical ones, but it has the curved letters too. For example, like the letter Ya. As you can see here, the letter Ya is kind of uh, goes back, you know, creates a line in the middle of the mm, inscription. It's, I think it's very beautiful. And you see those vertical letters that give like a vertical effect uh, to the handwriting. And as uh, I said um, the sizing of everything uh, is, uh, I didn't say that here. Okay, so the sizing of everything is based on the letter A or Aleph. So for example, this one has seven dots and as you can see seven is like a sacred number in Islam. So they were measuring everything based on the seven dots that was the, the length of uh, Aleph. So why? Aleph. So Aleph is the first letter in, alpha, in, in the Arabic alphabet and the beginning of the word Allah, which means God. And uh, so it's the basis kind of for all the letters in, in, in the alphabet. And it's a kind of vertical linear form and it kind of metaphorically represents heaven and earth and where the, those Sufis or those spiritual seekers are uh, want to return to. And also, uh, some Sufi scholars believe that Aleph, because of its form, is kind of pointing to God. And because everything comes from God, so the letters emerge from the letter Aleph, and which like a kind of kind of related to humans that are created by God. So because everything is from those Aleph, that Aleph letter, so the size and measurement of everything is based on this letter. So, and I think one of the finest examples of Thodos handwriting is in Imam Reza and Shrine in Mashhad. So next time, probably you could go and visit it, inshallah, try to spot those uh, Thodos handwritings uh, uh, in the dome and different pine, uh, part, uh, in different parts of, especially the oldest parts of, uh, of, the, of like the mosque, not the new, like the added parts, newly added parts. And again, this one, I think more clearly shows the Thulos handwritings on the dome. And this one's uh, very close uh, to, um, to uh, the tomb itself. And as you can see here, we have like Nasalik here, and then again, we have Thulos. Again, another beautiful example is in the, in the Hakim Mosque of Isfahan, which is a very beautiful and fine example of Thulos handwriting. You can see the verticality is very like apparent here in, in, in this one. And also this one, um, this is in Torbat Jam. This is a very famous uh, mihrab in, uh, that is kind of carved out of the plaster. And I think you should see it in person. This one's really beautiful. Okay, so last one is Nasalia. So about Nasali, we can say that 100% made in Iran and it was created by Iranian calligraphers. Uh, it is the finest one with the less area and has the most curves. 
And they say it's, uh, the, the, it was inspired by the pre-Islamic Persian forms such as Pahlavi, but it is used less than uh, to other forms in architecture. You can see clearly here, you can see the difference between the alphabet and the writing in Kufi, Tholos, and Nastaria. And uh, these are two examples in Isfahan of Nasari. So, and having a new font does not mean that the other fonts are like obsolete and they're not gonna be used anymore. Uh, so after a new font was coming, architects were like beautifully in like, you know, uh, have, uh, adding those fonts to their design as well, uh, in, in addition to the older ones. Uh, so uh, there are many examples of all three uh, fonts together. For example, this one is in Jama Moscow, Esfahan. As you can see, this is Nastadi here, and this is Solos, and they are both used together. Again, here we see Kufi handwriting on the minars, and we see Solos around the. Uh, um, this this is the entrance area. And here we see Nastadi here. Uh, and Kufi here and Tholos here. So we have all three together. And this one is also a mehrab in, um, I think it's called Old Jaitu Mehrab, I think, if I remember correctly, in uh, Jama Moscow of Esfahan, which is like, I think one of the most beautiful things that you can see. And, and these are really full of details and all carved out of plaster. And again, you see many different fonts uh, together here. And here, the beautiful thing is that they mix everything with the, for example, we have uh, Thodos with the plant motifs and different geometries, uh, which is like designed 3D in a 3D form. They're not flat. And this one is Pira background tomb in, Isfah in Isfahan. Again, this one is the Mihrab. And again, you see those plant motifs and everything. And it's very pretty that you see Thodos here and inside the Tholos, you see a Kufi handwriting just above it. And again, they were using plan motifs in the tiles as well. For example, they have Tholos and the plan motifs as a background. And this one uh, is the zoomed in. I, I probably had to put it before, but uh, it's again the pure background tomb in Esfahan. You can see the details when you see like when you look at it closely, it's very beautiful. And again, like for example, this one is kind of just carved out of the break. It feels like 3D. And they were used, they were using different material materials as well. For example, you see like tiles and breaks here or stone. Or in the Jama Moscow of Esfahan, you see uh, like in Sheikh Al you see very fine examples of tile works. And Jama Moscow uh, Yaz, again, we have Kufi here and Tholos around the Mehrab, and all of them are in tiles and paints, uh, metals, and also the placement and where those architects were putting those inscriptions was very important too. And they usually paid a lot of attention to their size and the like the placement. And sometimes even before designing a building, they knew exactly where, where, are going to, where they're going to put a, each of those inscriptions. Uh, so um, they're actually, those inscriptions feel like they are independent elements. But at the same time, they are integrated and blended into the whole building. And, uh, and usually, most important place was given to those inscriptions and handwritings. As you can see, for example, here around this dome, these two layers, uh, these two like layers of the inscriptions give you the feel that probably the whole weight of the dome is sitting on the holy words of Quran. And it shows the rise and attention uh, toward the sky and the world above as well. So the architect is kind of, or the artist is illustrating a world where everything is sourced from the holy words as if there would be no existence, ex existence without those words. Thank you. Great. Um, 
I can see virtual pauses. That was very interesting to me. And I'm sure it has been the same for the others. Um, so one thing is uh, it help us to, whenever the next time that we visit and we sightsee those places, we appreciate more uh, the art that has been used and the efforts that have been put into those buildings. And at this one point for me was good because I always thought that I have a problem that I cannot read most of them. <laughs> but at least after today's presentation, that was a good thing that I realized that, okay, so it's more of Maybe the I'm visual art. <laughs> Yeah, it's more of the visual art that it then to the purpose would be to read them out. Thank you very much. That's what that was so interesting. We yeah, have time. My main goal was uh, to because I think calligraphy is one of the ignored or uh, ignored arts inside the buildings, and usually people don't see them. So probably next time you go to see visit different places, probably try to spot those writings and recognize the type of fonts and everything. Yeah, thank exactly. you. Exactly, that's exactly the point that. Maybe we are uh, underappreciating that. Thank you, but uh, uh, we have a couple of minutes and uh, well, we are open to the questions of the audience. If you have any questions, you can either unmute yourself, ask the question uh, from the presenter, or you can write it directly in the chat and uh, uh, me or Sister Mansour can uh, read it out and answer the questions. Please go ahead if you have any questions. Uh, while we are waiting for the question, please do not leave the session. We'll have a short survey at the end of the session and also a short du'a for Imam Zaman Ajalullah. So uh, please stay until the end of the event. Any questions? Okay, we got one in the chat, uh, actually two. So the first one is, what is the main difference between Iranian Islamic calligraphy and the other Islamic countries? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> um, I don't have like actually an answer for, I don't know. I, I actually didn't study other countries calligraphy, so I don't have a good answer for that, but that can be an interesting area to study. Hmm, all right. And the next question uh, from Brother Hamad says, how different does the value of art affect Western architecture versus Islamic? The value of art? Yeah, how different does the value of art affect Western architecture versus Islamic? I think maybe- Painting and calligraphy? I think so, or- so we, on the, or the importance of the art in architecture. I think she, he's asking about the importance of the art in the architecture, in the Islamic architecture compared to the Western uh, architecture. If you I'm know, in the past, that like correctly. most people, uh, religious buildings were very important. As you can see in Western and Eastern architecture, we usually see all those details and paintings in, in the religious architecture. So the mosque, like the mosques or churches. So those were considered as important buildings and the people were donating a lot of money to build a mosque uh, to, the, to the designers and everywhere. So that's why uh, there are the best forms of arts are usually present in those buildings. And I, I think it's wrong to give value to different forms of art because some people just try to you know, kind of prove that some sort of art has more value or is finer or harder to do. But I think that like both forms in investor and Eastern have their own like value and uh, you know, they are, they're done in the best way. And someone's asking me, does the color of letters play a symbolic role? So because most of the time they were using uh, the materials they had. So that, that, that was kind of the color that, and that was kind of the thing that was making, you know, making them to use a specific color. For example, about the tile works, um, they usually use the colors that they could, you know, uh, um, what do you say, um, paint, you know, those, uh, because they were mainly from nature and from plants. So that's why we see those colors like the Persian blue and everything on the tiles. Uh, but usually they try to use colors from nature because I think that was, they, they, they were trying to do the best thing they had. For example, in Imam Reza Shrine, around, around the tomb itself, we have a tile work called a Kashi half rang or seven colored tile, which is 
which was produced by a, a family in Kashan. And that was a very expensive because they were using a different kind of methods, <clears throat> excuse me, to create those effects in that aspect in, and those uh, tile works. Next time you go to Mashhad and uh, try to find them. And uh, the, when the light, uh, you know, the light kind of makes the, the color of the tiles different. So people usually try to do the best they could and uh, give their finest uh, like and the best attempt to design uh, like religious buildings. Perfect. And we have uh, one more question from Steve asking, can you talk more about the process of translating calligraphy to uh, uh, translating calligraphy to architecture? Is the person creating it in the building copying what a calligrapher does? How challenging is that? And how much credit should be uh, should the sculpture uh, sculptor or uh, other get compared to the calligrapher? Yeah, exactly. They were actually like a group of probably builders. So the calligrapher was one person, but there, were, there was a tile person that was actually carving out those pieces of writings uh, uh, from the tiles. Uh, but yeah, you, most of the time, unfortunately, they are anonymous. And because, as I said, as I explained about those Sufi mannerism in Persian architecture and Islamic architecture, they were trying to stay anonymous uh, because they were doing that only like for God, uh, but yeah, they were usually they were done by different different people, and uh, I don't know how to give credit to different uh, to dif to those different artists. Perfect. And we have another question as asking: Is there any effort for using these techniques with English alphabets? Um, is there like the calligraphy techniques that we have for? Arabic or Persian alphabets, any way to implement them into or have been? You mean, are the, are the English calligraphy is uh, kind of um, inspired, are, are inspired by Islamic uh, calligraphers? I'm, I'm not sure about that, really, I don't know. But I just showed you an example of pseudo Kufi that we're trying to kind of imitate the Kufi handwriting um, because they thought that's similar to uh, Jesus, you know, the, the, hand, the handwriting is used in the time of Jesus, but I'm not sure if the, the current uh, English calligraphy uh, technique is from um, Islamic calligraphy. Okay. And, and I'm sure about the Cathedral of Florence, which is a copy of Sultania's architects. That's, that's a, <laughs> I don't know, that's a big thing to talk about because Sultania, I, I think Sultania is a very small, uh, uh, like Tom, I think in Zanja, if you mean that one, and the Cathedral of Florence, I'm not sure. <laughs> all right, hopefully I have we have covered uh, all questions and we have not missed anything, but uh, thank you all again uh, for attending and also thank you to the presenter. You are seeing a survey on your screen. Please go ahead and um, fill out the survey. It's basically as asking about the rate of um how the program has been announced and how it has been presented um please go ahead and give us uh, we'll give you just one or two minutes and we'll have a short dua for imam zaman to conclude the session So again, we are waiting uh, for all of you to go ahead and kindly fill out the survey uh, that we have for tonight's uh, presentation. So far, 14 of 22 uh, have been attended. We would much appreciated if all of you could fill out the survey, please. Okay, we have only two 
and I think we are getting ready for the uh, for concluding the session. Again, thank you all very much. Also, thank you, Sister Mansura. It was very interesting, very informative. Um, thank you all. Please stay for us for the final du'a uh, to conclude our session. Uh, the du'a for Imam Zaman, uh, recited by Brother Muhammad Reza. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Allahumma kull waliyyika al-hujjat ibn al-Hasan Salawatuka alayhi wa ala abai Fi hadha al-sa'ah Wa fi kull sa'ah وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا سلام اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعجل فرجهم thank you very much brother محمد رضا thank you all for attending please keep each other in your prayers and also follow the apps other apps network programs in the following days السلام عليكم ورحمة الله Thank you. Goodbye.